20 months to 1 million. Being the owner of multiple businesses, I am always conscious of my money from a personal and professional perspective. Our lives are very much intertwined and often controlled by our ability to manage, save, and spend our money. I was recently reminded of a great concept that I learned about when I was a teenager. If a person were to take one dollar, invest the dollar in an asset, and then sell the asset for two dollars, they will have then taken the first step in a 20-month process of accumulating a million dollars. The only habit that would need to be created is the habit of doubling the amount of money in hand every month for 20 months. Here is how the math would work out. Start off with one dollar. End of month one, you have two dollars. End of month two, you have four dollars. End of month three, you have eight dollars. Month four, sixteen dollars, and so on. If you keep doing the math, you see that by month 19, you have 524,000 plus dollars, and by month 20, over 1 million dollars. Obviously, the model is very simple and the idea is basic enough for anyone to grasp. However, I'd like to expand on the underlying psychology of this concept. Let's imagine that we were going to make a committed decision to implement this model in our own personal financial lives, and we could not skip any steps or take any shortcuts. By the end of the first year, we will have accumulated only $4,096. This means that in the next eight months, we will have to amass 995,904 more than we currently have to reach the $1 million level. At this point, this imaginary experiment becomes more of a fairy tale or daydream to the average person. But let's think about our minds and the power of focus. For the first 12 months of the experiment, we were making a monthly habit of acquiring assets, likely devalued assets, and selling them at a higher price point. As each month went by, we were forced to become more creative and innovative with our investments as the challenge of each amount grew larger. Assuming we were successful for the first 12 months, the challenge on month 13 would be to double 4,096 to 8,192. After an entire year of practicing with small amounts and getting into this habit, the only real change required would be to adjust our perception of the size of the investment. There are plenty of people in the world who have had success doubling large sums of money in short periods of time. Business acquisitions, real estate, and currency trading, just to name a few. The average person may not understand how to do it, but they most certainly could learn if they were to focus their mind and their attention on the task and do whatever it takes to learn the required skill. I once heard T. Harv Eker use the extreme example that if it was a life or death situation and your life depended on you making a million dollars in one year, you could figure out a way to do it. And I completely agree. The point I'm trying to make is that I truly believe we are all capable of achieving a goal like this if the stakes are high enough. Why then do so few people ever try to achieve such a major goal? Why do so many people reject the idea before giving any serious thought to it? There are probably a number of reasons, but from my perspective, the primary reason a person would never attempt a goal like this is because in their heart, they don't believe they can do it. If they did believe they could achieve the goal, would they not be actively working on it? Of course they would. With that in mind, we can begin to understand the powerful role that beliefs play in our lives. From the standpoint of our minds, a psychologist would say that a belief is nothing more than an idea that we have consciously accepted as true and ingrained as part of our subconscious conditioning. If we are holding on to beliefs that limit us and keep us from taking action on a life-changing idea, with the proper awareness we can make the conscious decision to formulate a new belief that supports us in our big life goals. I think it's both healthy and wise for every person to take time out regularly to examine their habits of thought. Since this audio is centered around the idea of financial goals and money, I would encourage you to step back and review your personal thought processes when you were introduced to the idea of 20 months to 1 million. If you rejected the idea as something that was unrealistic or out of your level of capability, take some time to examine the belief you are holding onto that is causing you to reject this idea. What other limiting beliefs have crept into your mind that are no longer serving you? Can you replace those beliefs with a more empowering and gratifying thought pattern? Thanks for listening to 20 Months to 1 Million.
Cherish the tough times. We've all been there at some point in our life. Everything seems to be moving along smoothly when something suddenly happens. A challenge, a barrier, or a crisis. These events can range anywhere from being mildly inconvenient to downright terrible and sometimes devastating. When situations like this arise, we all have ultimately one choice to make. How will we choose to respond? When you boil it down, that is really how our entire life unfolds. We are making a never-ending series of choices about how we will interact with the events and circumstances surrounding us. Many of these choices occur unconsciously as part of our conditioned behavior patterns. Understanding that we always retain the power and the right to make a conscious choice about our reactions is where we can transform challenges into huge opportunities. Consider the notion of personal perception. Every person observes and interprets the world around them from a unique vantage point. I remember very clearly an incident about five years ago when I was having lunch on a restaurant patio with a few of my colleagues. The patio was next to a really busy street. About 20 minutes into our meal, we were all startled by a large crash followed by an excitable yelp sound. As I turned in my seat to examine the incident, we saw a new sports car t-boned by an older sedan. Fortunately, the collision had taken place at a relatively slow speed so there were no injuries, just two very upset drivers. The yelp sound had come from a tow truck driver who had been parked literally across the street. He was so excited that an accident had occurred right in front of his truck, meaning he would be the first tow provider on the scene. Talk about drastically opposing perspectives. Now these two unfortunate drivers were caught up in a very unpleasant experience while the tow truck entrepreneur had his latest gig essentially fall into his lap. What's most interesting about this example is that it illustrates to me that the world around us simply exists. Nothing more, nothing less. It is not until we apply our personal perception along with our expectations and beliefs that events become positive or negative. Since we are creative by nature and always have 100% control over our thoughts, we can then choose to seek out the positives in life. When something happens to us that initially appears to be negative, we have an opportunity to reject our habitual reaction and create a new, more empowering belief about that event. I have personally made a habit of this type of mentality and I continue to develop this capability every passing day. I am becoming someone who can cherish the tough times. When adversity strikes, I am often able to control my attitude and remain focused on the positive rather than being consumed by the apparent misfortune. I then remind myself of Robert Collier's quote, in every adversity there lies the seed of an equivalent advantage. Dustin Carter is no stranger to adversity. Dustin was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder at age five. The doctors were forced to amputate the majority of all of his limbs. Despite his obvious challenges, Dustin is now a top student wrestler working towards a full wrestling scholarship. He's a tremendous inspiration to everyone who meets him, and he gives hope to others who may be facing physical challenges. Many successful entrepreneurs have been able to transform challenging life situations into business building opportunities. One of the best examples of this is Robert Allen. His book, Nothing Down, How to Buy Real Estate with Little or No Money Down, went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list after a controversial ad he ran to promote it. In the ad, Allen claimed that you could take him to any city, take his wallet away, give him $100, and he could buy a piece of real estate. After Allen's book had achieved great success, a reporter from the LA Times challenged his claim in the ad and called him a fraud. In order to prove himself, Allen was forced to take the challenge and prove he could actually achieve the feat. Not knowing if he would actually be able to pull it off, Robert Allen began to worry and realize that he would be professionally ruined if he was not able to deliver. In a formally arranged meeting, the reporter met Allen in San Francisco, took his wallet, and gave him $100. With his name and credibility on the line, Allen took the $100 and purchased seven properties worth a total of $700,000 in a 57-hour window. Needless to say, he went on to achieve enormous success in his career. How would your life change if you were able to transform a negative event into a positive experience? What kind of results could you produce if you learned to embrace adversity and treat it as an opportunity for growth? Regardless of the nature of the challenge you are facing, 
Decide to become the kind of person who embodies this philosophy and you will most assuredly begin to produce incredible things in your life while providing inspiration to those around you. Thanks for listening to Cherish the Tough Times. Don't what if yourself to death. What if the motivation killer? If you are the kind of person who has goals, ambitions, dreams, and big ideas for your life, then you know that taking risks is an essential component of success. Lou Bascaglia said, the person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing, and becomes nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he simply cannot learn and feel and change and grow and love and live. Risk is a natural part of life, and the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. I don't think many people would argue with this point. Here is the dilemma. When it comes to risk, many people tend to what-if themselves out of any and every positive idea that might move them in the direction of their goals. What I mean by what-if themselves is that they imagine all kinds of disaster scenarios that may or may not occur should they take what appears to be a risky action. Here is a prime example. I left a career position with a blue chip company to pursue my dream business. When I handed in my resignation letter, I had a number of supportive colleagues and some who were not so supportive of my decision. But even the supportive people would talk to me about my big decision and look at me as the lucky one. They admired my bold move, but in the same breath would talk about how they wish they could do the same. When I told them there was nothing stopping them from doing exactly what I was doing, they quickly responded with their what-if disaster scenarios. What if I don't earn enough money to pay my bills? What if I have a medical expense that I can't afford to pay? What if I make the wrong decision and open the wrong kind of business? What if I have to work on weekends? Now, I agree, these are all valid concerns given the conversation involved walking away from a good-paying job. But the damage being done by imagining these things is where the real problem lies. Not one of these what-if statements assumed a positive outcome. Not one of those statements talked about all of the good that might happen in the person's life if they were to walk away from a job they didn't like in order to pursue a dream business. While none of these negative scenarios had taken place, their mind convinced them that it was inevitable. The only difference between their mindset and my own was that I was using my imagination to think of all the positive potential outcomes of leaving a job and pursuing a business. I was thinking only of the positive outcomes. I was trusting. They had the ability to trust as well. In fact, they were already doing it, but simply didn't realize it. Every person does this every day. There is inherent risk with every single action you take in your life. Every time you get into your car, there is a risk of getting into an accident. When you go for a walk, there is a risk of being mugged. When you go to a restaurant, there is a risk of choking or food poisoning. When you take a shower, there is a risk of falling and hitting your head. The list is infinite. The reason that most people don't worry about these things is that we have come to trust that we generally are going to be safe throughout the course of our day. Unless something traumatic has happened, you probably don't ever think about these kind of disaster scenarios. Well, the exact same kind of thinking is required by the person who wants to pursue a big life goal and take action on the risky steps required to reach that goal. Could you lose money? Yes. Could you go bankrupt? Yes. Could you fall and break your leg? Yes. Welcome to life. If you are ready, willing, and committed to achieving great things for your life, then you need to change your what-if questions from negative to positive. What if I make it? What if I become wealthy? What if I save a life? What if I become free? What if I overcome my fears? What if I live my life to the fullest? Thank you for listening to Don't What If Yourself to Death. Making a Habit of Personal Development It can be a rather amusing task to sit back and analyze some of the daily rituals we perform, often without giving any conscious thought. I believe this is a good thing because we would accomplish very little if we had to stop and think about every task we perform. Just today, 
I was making the short drive from my home to the library, where I do most of my writing, when I noticed I had been completely engrossed in thoughts about the book I'm working on. I had to look in the back seat to check if I even brought my laptop and writing materials. I then became aware of all the other things that had to take place just to make this short trip. Among other things, I had to put on my shoes, put on my jacket, walk from the house to the car, unlock the car with the keyless entry, place my bag in the back seat, sit in the driver's seat, fasten the seatbelt, start the car, and so on. The entire time this was happening, my thoughts were directed towards my task for the day. This got me thinking about some of the other habit patterns in our life that we consciously decide to do without really asking ourselves if the task is really the most important thing on our list. For example, many people choose to watch a number of hours of television each day. I personally know people who spend an unusual amount of time cleaning their home or randomly browsing the internet. The point I'm trying to make is that most of us can probably uncover at least one hour of time each day that we give to meaningless tasks. The interesting thing is, if you ask most people if they are happy with all the results in their life, the truthful answer is often no. My goal is to encourage people to dedicate some time every single day to personal reflection and self-development. If you are unhappy with a certain situation, you have the ability to change your thinking and ultimately your behavior so that you can improve that particular circumstance. Instead of watching a daytime drama or indulging in excessive dusting and mopping, you might want to consider picking up a book or audio program that forces you to examine your results. From my personal experience, this simple action produces an internal reaction. Because you are examining your own personal results, you quickly realize that you are the only one who can change them. Unfortunately, in our society today, People are fixated on producing immediate results and having tangible evidence in their hands the minute they ask for something. With personal development, the true benefits can only be realized when we incorporate the ideas into a habit. Think about it this way. If you were to make a firm commitment to read or listen to personal development educational programs for even 30 minutes a day for the next two weeks, what kind of positive impact could this have on your life? What if you did it for two months? Similar to unconscious activities such as getting dressed or brushing your teeth, you would start to create a new habit and become the kind of person who automatically takes action on ideas that move you in the direction of improved results. From personal experience, I can attest to the fact that this kind of self-study works. It really is a never-ending process because it is part of our nature to grow, expand, and develop, and ultimately, it provides an excellent opportunity to make positive life changes. As you become more involved in personal development, you will start to notice areas of your life that are working well and other areas that require improvement. This kind of education will help you harness ideas that will improve your results while at the same time overcome all of the inhibitors standing in the way of you achieving your aim. A common question I hear is, where do I start? There are so many good authors, philosophies, and ideas on this topic that you can never really say which style will work. The best advice I have ever received from this perspective is to study and learn from those who are producing the results that you would like in your life. It's a pretty basic lesson, but a very important one. Seek out the people who have already achieved what you would like to achieve and learn from them. Success often leaves clues, and it is up to you to find those clues and act on them. With a daily commitment to personal improvement, you will quickly become a master detective who will transform each clue into a tangible action that will lead you to a more fulfilled life. Thanks for listening to Making a Habit of Personal Development. Instant and lasting motivation. Do you have a list of goals and desires that have yet to be fulfilled? Do you find yourself generating exciting new ideas only to find that you lose the motivation to complete them shortly after you get started? Perhaps you talk yourself out of that great new idea even before you begin to pursue it. The good news is that there is a very simple yet powerful technique that you can adopt immediately to help you commit to completion. The technique is called decision. Proper decision-making ability is a vital life skill that many people fail to develop at all. 
At first glance, this idea may seem trivial and possibly not useful, but consider the context of this discussion. When I talk about decision, I refer to somebody's personal commitment to the completion of a set objective. For some people, the simple act of making a binding agreement with themselves is enough to get the job done. For the majority of people, however, a more bold approach to decision making can be applied for maximum effectiveness. Consider the following example. Before I started my personal development company, I had been interested in becoming a speaker and I always studied and tested various ideas and techniques that I was learning about the personal development industry. I knew I had an inner calling to follow this passion and teach people what I knew about these ideas and philosophies. I attended an inspirational seminar where the speakers were talking about this very topic. The main message I received that day was that we are all 100% responsible for our results and we are capable of setting any goal we want for our life. I really took this to heart and started to contemplate the idea of becoming a platform speaker, teaching, inspiring, and motivating audiences, much like the people who I was watching that day. Because I was in a state of mind that allowed me to get emotionally involved with the idea, it grew beyond a daydream, and I started thinking about how I could make this happen. I started studying personal development principles for many hours a day, and taking note of which techniques I was already using in my current career, while learning and applying new ideas in various areas of my life, like family, fitness, and financial. Eventually, the idea of starting a business as a speaker grew so heated that I knew I had to do something. For about a week, I played a mental chess match with myself, thinking about all the reasons why I should pursue this dream, while simultaneously thinking about all the reasons why I could not do it. As soon as I learned this lesson about decision, everything changed, and my life has never been the same. I woke up one morning and made a committed decision to book my first public workshop. I picked a date about one month out, found a hall to host it, and booked the hall with a down payment. I was locked in and committed to doing this. It was both a mental and physical move that made a world of difference. The ambivalence instantly disappeared and my mind moved into a much more creative mode. Instead of worrying about whether or not I could even accomplish this goal, I started asking myself a new set of questions. What topic do I run the workshop on? How do I advertise? Who do I market to? Needless to say, I completed that workshop a month later and so began the inception of my own personal development company, which I now run as a full-time business. My full dream realized. The key point to be emphasized is that I made a committed decision and backed that decision with a tangible forcing function. Like the stories of the Renaissance explorers, I had arrived at a destination burned my ships, and had no choice but to move forward and deliver the goods. Can you think about a committed decision you could make today, right now, that could ultimately alter the entire direction of your life? Perhaps there's a trip you've been meaning to take that could open a new world of opportunity. Call the travel agent or get online now and book it. If you've been struggling with your health and fitness, maybe you can find a competition to enter, pay the entry fee, whatever it is, Make the decision and lock yourself into the decision to ensure you have a solid forcing function. If the idea moves you in the direction of your dream or purpose, make the committed decision today. Thanks for listening to The Secret to Instant and Lasting Motivation. Step into the fear. There's no feeling like it. It is real and it is powerful. It creates intense physical sensations that cause our brains to scream, retreat. It is also useful because it keeps us alert and keeps us safe. It is the emotion of fear and has been one of my greatest adversaries. Growing up, I was never once accused of being a major risk taker. I was not interested in being adventurous or exploratory. I remember being afraid to try the big toboggan hill, terrified of going on roller coasters, and the thought of doing a student exchange program simply did not enter my realm of possibility. For whatever reason, I was very much controlled by my fears. I'll never forget a specific incident that occurred over 17 years ago. I was in 7th grade, and my teacher recognized me as one of the top spellers in the school. He invited me to participate in the spelling bee, which would take place in the auditorium in front of the entire school. I can still vividly remember the crippling sensations of fear as I visualized myself spelling a word incorrectly in front of the entire school. 
Without hesitation, I declined his invite and told him it's really not something I'm interested in. Yeah, right. This was exactly something I was interested in. But the fear once again kept me in the bleachers. What made the whole event so tough to swallow was that I actually would have won had I participated. I knew how to spell every word in the competition, including the word that eliminated the final participant. Fear took me out of the game before it started. Fear cost me a huge win, personal success, and school fame. My sister, on the other hand, seemed to have been born with a higher threshold for fear. I remember her bombing down that same toboggan hill that I was scared to try. And she is four years younger than me. As for travel, at age 15 she took the first opportunity to travel across the world alone and live with a family in Germany for a few months. To this day, she continues to live an adventure-filled life, including moving 5,000 kilometers away from our home to do her master's degree, snowboarding down a mountain, and even skydiving. Does she experience fear? Of course, but she does not permit fear to be a deciding factor in her goals and aspirations. When I finally adopted the same mindset and made a commitment to take action in spite of fear, I was able to take full control of my life and implement lasting change. As I began to work on myself and learned what my fears were and why they existed, I started to truly understand the limitations that fear had created in my life. Once I placed my focus on what my fears had been costing me, the motivation to overcome the fears seemed to blossom. I actually felt angry because I was now associating the pain of missing out on life's adventures with my inability to transcend my fears. I now see fear, doubt, and worry for what they truly are imagined catastrophes. I once heard an author say that fear stands for fantasized expectations appearing real, and I couldn't agree more. When I am feeling fearful, I can effectively deal with the emotion because I now understand that I am literally using my imagination to contemplate a disastrous outcome to a situation. Having this awareness allows me to move forward, experience the physical sensations being caused by the fear, and ultimately overcome the feeling. The best part about learning how to overcome fear is the true sensation of liberation. To set the record straight, yes, I was a fearful kid, but I still had some amazing experiences, and many came when I mustered up enough courage to do something that scared me. When Canada's youth television network, YTV, was at our school doing auditions for a kid's game show, not only did I step up to the plate, but I actually made it on the show. Despite feeling extremely nervous and fearful of looking foolish on television, I went ahead and gained a life experience that my family still talks about today. From a professional perspective, I've had to work extremely hard at dealing with fear when it comes to public speaking. Despite the fact that I quit my career to pursue a business in personal development speaking and coaching, I had a significant amount of anxiety when it came to standing up in front of an audience. You see, my ultimate goal is to be a top-ranked platform speaker like so many of my mentors. But I set this goal with the awareness that I had a fear of speaking and I would have to transform and reinvent myself completely to fulfill this desire. I would consider this particular task to be a work in progress. I continued to get up and speak in front of audiences. The size of the audience is progressively gr growing larger and the size of my fear is progressively getting smaller. Instead of worrying about my next presentation, I am now eagerly practicing and preparing to deliver a performance to the best of my ability. The audience feedback is indicating that I am on the right track. It's the culmination of these positive indicators that continue to chip away at my fear and move me towards full liberation. While I accept and embrace fear as part of the equation that keeps me sharp, I am able to continually move forward and develop myself to new levels and plateaus. Life is much more exciting now that I have learned to step into the fear. Thanks for listening to Step Into the Fear. Systemize your success. When it comes to personal behavior and getting your daily activities in harmony with your life goals, it is absolutely critical to have a system in place. Brain researchers claim that between 90 and 95 percent of all human behavior is habitual, which means we literally perform these activities without really thinking about them. 
Without a system to govern your critical activities, you will very likely fall victim to your habits and never truly accomplish the goals you set out to achieve. As a person who is working on a number of major goals for my lifetime, I am always examining my results and looking for ways to improve the quality of my work and manage the time I choose to allocate to all of my activities. There have been periods of incredible productivity and other times where it seemed that everything was at a standstill, even though I felt extremely busy. Upon reflection, it is easy to see that the main reason I experienced success during those productive times was due to the presence of a well-defined system. The word system can be defined as a coordinated body of methods or a scheme or plan of procedure, organizational scheme. When I think of a system, I think of a list of activities performed in a certain order with a specific result in mind. Ultimately, a properly defined and implemented system is the key to success in any area of life. Just take a quick look around you and you can begin to appreciate the value of a well-defined system. In many cases, the entire system has been automated for optimum performance. If you have any doubts, just think about what happens when you place a phone call, start your computer, turn on your lights, flush your toilet, start your car, or even when you eat dinner. Each process is handled by a system that is responsible for producing a certain result. In the same light, I believe it is critically important for every person to have an activity management system for their life, a system that has been designed to help a person reach all of their desired goals and aspirations. For me, having a system brings clarity to my mind and removes the potential of procrastination. It forces me to focus on what I really want to accomplish and take action accordingly. For example, when I was going through the mental transition from corporate employee to self-employed entrepreneur, there were a number of activities I knew I had to ingrain as part of my behavior. Before I really understood the concept of systemizing my calendar, I instinctively knew that I had to build a system that would help me create my new habits. For a period of probably 100 days, maybe more, I woke up every morning and opened my activity journal. I would divide the page in half. The right side of the page was a list of six success habits that I decided to implement in my life. Family time, fitness, good deeds, personal development studying, business activities, and mental fitness, which would include something like meditation, visualization exercises, vision boarding, and so on. The left side of the page would be a growing list of all activities that would pop up throughout the day. For example, returning an important phone call, doing my online banking, filing mail, etc. I would write every single activity down and check it off upon completion. As basic as it sounds, that particular system actually changed my life. First and foremost, I would not allow myself to go to bed at night without first crossing off all critical daily activities from the right side of the page. I was literally obligating myself to create new habits. Secondly, I would see the left side of each page completely full of checked off items. I felt great every time I looked at all the important activities I had completed and it gave me energy to do it again the next day. I believe that a good portion of our self-esteem comes from our ability to give ourselves an assignment and complete it. If there was a time I was feeling overwhelmed by my to-do list, I could quickly glance through my journal and remind myself how productive I could be when I put my mind to it. The accumulation of pages in my activity journal ultimately acted as a success log and always provided that extra boost of confidence when I needed it most. After a certain period of time, I'm not sure why, but I decided to stop using that system. I went back to a more informal task management system and basically relied on my calendar appointments to keep me on track. The really interesting thing that I noticed was that the habits I formed have remained with me for the most part. I have replaced some of those original success habits with new habits that fit my current business structure and lifestyle. At the same time, I recently came to the realization that due to my ever-growing list of work demands, my schedule was once again out of control and rather chaotic. I had been spending far too much time on low-priority work tasks. My fitness regimen was suffering some setbacks, and my overall level of enthusiasm was being affected. After some introspection, it became quite evident that it was time to systemize. The most difficult part of the entire process was forcing myself to stop, take a breath, and examine my results. Once I was able to do this, 
I could easily see the areas that needed improvement and was simply a matter of designing a new system that matched my current demands and lifestyle. I'm now back on track, more organized, and best of all, I'm feeling enthusiastic about my days again. Are you aware of how to spend the time in your day? Could you stand to be more efficient and productive? Perhaps you have broken some of the good habits that used to be part of your daily routine. If so, there has never been a better time to systemize. Thanks for listening to Systemizing Your Success. The Forgotten Skill of Focus Lately, I have noticed a common theme among many friends, colleagues, and associates. It seems we are all struggling with the same issue. The ability to stay focused on a single task for a prolonged period of time. When I recently took a mental inventory of my typical day, I quickly became alarmed by the number of concurrent tasks I found myself working on at any given time. Worse yet, when I examined my results and productivity levels, it was evident that I was struggling to keep up with previous outputs during the earlier phases of my business. Then I came across an article written by Josh Waitskin that pinpointed the direct cause of my reduced effectiveness. The article was on a topic he calls the multitasking virus, as posted on the Tim Ferriss blog at 4hourworkweek.com. In the article, Waitskin demonstrates the detrimental effects of multitasking and makes reference to a recent study at the British Institute of Psychiatry which showed that checking your email while performing another creative task decreases your IQ in the moment 10 points. That is equivalent of not sleeping for 36 hours, more than twice the impact of smoking marijuana. This was a real eye-opener for me. I would have a hard time counting the number of times I've been checking my email throughout any given workday. On more than one occasion, I would completely stop a task, often something more important, to tend to a new email that popped up in my inbox, regardless whether it was important email or not. Can you relate to this? When I discovered that this type of distraction was literally decreasing my IQ, I could immediately see certain areas where the quality of my work had been impacted. But it also forced me to stop and think about all the other distractions that I was allowing, knowingly or unknowingly, to impact my work. Between news and information websites, email, phone calls, instant messaging, and business research, I was probably getting distracted a minimum of 10 times a day. If you think that sounds like a high number, take a few moments right now to mentally review some of your own personal distractions. You will likely notice that they add up pretty quickly. In my case, these distractions would actually make me stop the task at hand and move on to something different. Often, I would move on to something of lower priority, but I was unable to recognize this at the time due to the fact that I'd been so severely distracted from my previous train of thought. Like anyone else, I'm at my best and produce my most valuable work when I'm able to stay focused and concentrated on one item at a time. This really applies to anything we perform. If you have ever learned a manual skill like laying a hardwood floor, using a weed remover for your lawn, or even running large stacks of paper through a laminating machine, these all happen to be tasks that I recently performed, you likely noticed a learning curve. At first, you might have felt awkward and you may have even fouled up your first few attempts at the task. Gradually though, you got the hang of it and developed a rhythm. After a certain period of time, you actually started to master the skill and eventually you were able to double, triple, and quadruple or even better your productivity. The same thing applies to practically everything we do in life. If you want to learn a new skill, the best way to do it is through a complete immersion process. If you want to run a marathon, you focus on running and likely divert from the weight room until after the competition. If you want to learn how to speak Spanish, your best bet is to get into a Spanish class and postpone your French class until you have mastered Spanish. Regardless of what you might be trying to accomplish, you will produce your best results when you are able to consistently focus on the highest priority activities. When I want to write an article, I remove myself from all distractions. I even remove myself physically from my office and go to the library or another spot where I have no choice but to focus on the task at hand. My local library happens to have neither wireless internet availability nor cell phone reception. This combination makes for the perfect cure to my typical interruptions. I am often able to complete my articles or reports in less than a third of the time it would have taken me 
had I been working from my office and connected to my world of distractions. An empowering discovery I made about utilizing the power of focus is that it becomes increasingly easier to stay focused for longer stretches as you develop the mental discipline. One of the six intellectual faculties of every thinking person is something called will. This is our ability to sustain concentration on one item for an extended period of time. If you think of your will as a mental muscle, you can actually grow and develop this muscle similar to the way you would develop physical muscles at the gym through frequent exercise. If you are experiencing problems with productivity, take some time to carefully review the key points from this audio. Then, try to determine if and where you are falling victim to distractions. Make a commitment to eliminate these distractions, disconnect from the internet, turn off the cell phone, whatever, so you can begin to practice your focusing exercises. You may want to start with 30 minute blocks. Work on staying 100% present with the task at hand. Monitor your progress. As you feel comfortable and find your rhythm, work on stretching it out to an hour, then two hours, then go beyond if you can. But don't forget to listen to your mind and body. Taking breaks is absolutely critical for your long-term success. Since I often work from home, I use my breaks to drop all my work from my mind and spend quality time with my wife and kids. Whatever your situation, make sure you have an outlet to relieve your mind from your work for at least 15 minutes at a time. Then, when you're ready, go back and continue to strengthen your focusing skills. Thanks for listening to The Forgotten Skill of Focus. The Pain of Rejection I often observe the behavior of people to determine what drives and motivates them. Almost everyone I meet has a big vision and an inborn desire to be or do something far beyond their current reality. Very few people, however, take the required action to move towards those desires. There are plenty of reasons why someone does not take action on a big idea, but it usually boils down to some sort of fear that ultimately stops them. Okay, so I'm not uncovering any groundbreaking information here. We all have fears and most of us know how they've been affecting our results. What I intend to bring your awareness to is a study conducted by UCLA psychologists in 2003. The study found that there are two key areas within the human brain that respond to the pain of rejection in the same way they respond to physical pain. So, in essence, our body interprets a situation where we have been rejected in the same way it would interpret an event where we experienced real and harmful physical pain. Taking it a step further, the mere anticipation of rejection would also create the same sensation of fear as the anticipation of physical harm. That kind of fear is certainly powerful enough to prevent most of us from confronting it. What I personally find so powerful about this study is that it tells us more about the functionality of our brain and body. When we understand that our brain is sending out a false signal that may be preventing our success, we can now do something about it. We have the ability to consciously differentiate between a rejection scenario and a pain scenario. If we are facing a situation where we run the risk of being rejected and we don't want to let the fear of rejection stop us, we can actually pause and take inventory of how we're physically responding. If we notice any fear creeping into our awareness, we can decide to proceed rather than retreat. Even though this may be uncomfortable at first, it can be developed into a tremendous success habit over time. With this new understanding of rejection pain, it opens up a brand new door for us to examine our lives and more specifically, the goals we dream of achieving. As an entrepreneur, I am always studying sales and the most common success habits of elite salespeople. When I first read about this UCLA study, I immediately thought about some of the best salespeople whom I've had personally encountered. Every one of them, either consciously or unconsciously, separated rejection from pain. These top sellers would commonly say things like, they are not rejecting me, they are rejecting the idea of my product or service. The important thing to note is that they did not just blindly say these words, they truly believe them. And it is the one key ingredient that allowed these sales reps to move from one rejection to another without losing energy or motivation. By virtue of maintaining these attitudes, they eventually found plenty of customers who were indeed looking for what they were offering. 
They overcame rejection pain, and it led to a beautiful result. I can personally relate to the power of rejection pain when it comes to selling. While I have a number of years of experience in sales, I never actually had to do cold calling or door-to-door -door sales, the ultimate of rejection experiences. As part of a new project I recently became involved in, I was put in a position where I was forced to make cold calls in order to better understand the buying process of our prospective clients. Despite having logged thousands of hours doing live sales presentations and conference calls, nothing could have prepared me for the total discomfort of picking up the phone and cold calling a new lead. It was simply something I never really had to do in the past, and I could admit that I totally hated the feeling. In my efforts to work on myself to overcome this personal block, I was reminded of the UCLA study being cited in this article. Almost immediately, I felt as though a light had been turned on and I was able to pinpoint the source of my problem. I had been literally processing my fear of phone rejection as a threat similar to physical harm, thus causing my inability to confidently make cold calls to customers. This was still happening despite the fact that I had 100% faith and confidence in my product. The truth was, I just didn't like being told no or being hung up on. There are so many occasions in life where we enter a situation in which we might be rejected. Whether it is asking someone on a date, applying for a new job, sharing our dreams with people, singing in front of an audience, or public speaking, we often run the risk of some form of rejection. When we develop ourselves to the point where we treat rejection and pain as two totally different experiences, we can then freely and confidently move in the direction of our ultimate goals and dreams. Thanks for listening to The Pain of Rejection. universe inside your brain. The title of this audio has been named after a chapter in the powerful personal development and business development book called The Answer by John Asaraf and Murray Smith. This book has had such a positive impact on my business and personal life that I felt compelled to share what I've learned and how I've applied it in my life. John Asaraf has been studying personal growth philosophies as well as brain science for the better part of 25 years. When he refers to a universe inside of our brains, he makes an excellent analogy. When I think of the universe, I think of a huge array of systems and processes that flow together in perfect harmony. And that is exactly what our brains do. With the latest developments in science and technology, we now know more about the brain than at any other time in human history. With that in mind, anyone interested in achieving success, developing their potential, and living a fulfilled life would be very wise to spend some significant time learning about this supercomputer we have in our heads. Whether you realize it or not, your brain has been programmed to control your behavior and is directly responsible for the results you are producing in your life. This is where the answer comes in and where I've been able to personally implement some of the life-changing ideas. One lesson that had a significant impact on me was the fact that our conscious brain is responsible for only 2 to 4% of our overall behavior. This means that 96 to 98% of what we do every single day is managed and controlled by our non-conscious brain. We don't have to think about these tasks, they are taken care of without our conscious awareness. Examples I have noticed for myself include sitting in a chair, getting dressed, chewing food, writing notes and even driving my car. These tasks did require my conscious attention at some point earlier in my life, but through repetition have become installed in my non-conscious brain. What's amazing is that it is almost impossible to list out all of the activities we perform on a daily basis because there are so many. With the awareness that only 2-4% to of these activities require us to actually think, it becomes quite obvious that using willpower or other similar forcing functions to reach a major goal in life is futile at best. The true solution is to reprogram the non-conscious section of the brain so that those automatic actions work for us and move us towards our goals. Here is one example of how I made this work personally. Knowing that I had many goals that I had not yet reached and being aware of this conscious non-conscious relationship, I was able to sit down and mentally review my self-limiting thoughts and behaviors. So 
Some of my personal examples included wasting time reading unimportant email, eating a snack when I was not truly hungry, reacting with anger when a situation did not go as I wanted it to, starting a good business book but not completing it or implementing it. The list goes on as well. By simply becoming aware of these non-conscious habits, I have been able to organize my own personal development routines to replace these actions with more positive and empowering ones. I will shed more light on this as we move forward in this audio. Another lesson that I learned from The Answer has to do with what some people call self-image, or in the case of this book, the thermostat in your brain. The idea was originally described in the 1950s by Dr. Maxwell Maltz in his famous book, Psycho-Cybernetics. Essentially, this part of our brain is responsible for keeping us safe and free from danger. It also keeps us on track with a set point, much like a thermostat would do for the temperature in a house or an autopilot would do for an airplane. The problem is that our self-image sets the boundaries of our comfort zone and so it can prevent people from taking action that will bring them happiness and success if those actions require perceived risk. For me personally, I've always had the goal of having a toned figure with very low body fat and respectable muscle mass. While I've been quite disciplined at maintaining a fitness routine, my personal thermostat was not set at the same level as my goal. I'd always been anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds overweight for the majority of my life. Eating and drinking habits were my biggest challenge points. When I first got entrenched in personal development, I started to make some physical changes. I got down very close to my ideal body weight after years of trying to do so. I'd actually done so once in the past only to gain all of the weight back. Even though I'd worked very hard to get to that level, I still did not have the specific body shape and tone that I had always dreamed of. Despite my efforts, I still had lingering habits of eating and drinking that, in hindsight, I did not realize were problematic until I started studying the ideas in the answer. When I learned about the process of rewiring your brain to make significant and lasting changes in personal results, good things began to happen. In essence, if we want to ingrain a new habit into our behavior, we have to physically forge new neural pathways in the tissues of our brain. This is not a process that happens overnight, but rather something that takes time and repetition. Once I actually understood this process and studied what was going on inside of my brain, I was able to create 30, 60, and 90 day challenges for myself where I would perform new tasks and create new habits that move me closer to my ideal vision of my personal health. Those challenges help me form habits that I keep with me today and have made me a much more healthy person overall. What kind of new activities could you be implementing and rewiring into your brain to achieve bigger, better, and more exciting results for your life? Thanks for listening to The Universe Inside Your Brain.